experience. Batman experience. Batman experience. Batman experience. Experience. Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience. Wanted to do something a little bit different today in talking about how to actually bet on golf, where there's actual profitability, what are some of the common traps that you might fall into, which is basically I'll just describe my betting strategy, and then you don't do that, and then you might actually win money. So to break it all down with me, because you did an excellent off-season article on this, so I've been planning this out for a while, so... It's the time to bring him in from rotoballer.com. Use code MANIAC over at rotoballer.com and give some of that sweet, sweet affiliate money to Byron Linda Q, a.k.a. The Model Maniac. Sir, before we jump into golf, what is it with non-Americans and loving the New York Jets? It makes no sense to me. That I cannot tell you what our asphyxiation with that kind of <laughs> despair and disappointment is, but we, we love hurt, we love pain. The allure of the New York City, the Big Apple, the concrete jungle. Just, you know, our tears just run away that much easier when there's no grass to be seen. And I think that's what, you know, us uh, foreigners really appreciate about the New York Jets, you know. So it's, it's been tough a, times. It, it's been a good decade plus of being a Jets fan for you since you've moved to America? So I came over 2011 and I didn't know what NFC or AFC or divisional or conference was. Decided as a 19 year old, you know, well, I made some really bad decisions as a freshman, but the Jets choosing that team was one of them. And I've yet to see a playoff game in 13 years of Jets fandom. And we'd gone to back-to-back -back AFC Championship games two years before that. So that kind of describes my experience as a Jets fan. It's about as bad as it could possibly ever have been. Um, but, you know, next year, uh, that's one of my favorite, uh, favorite go-tos, though. Well, the first time you were on the show, it was me, you, and Alex Bickle from FTM. We were all nominated for Golf Writer of the Year by the Fantasy Sports Writers Association, which was nice. Alex won. We lost. So now we can do shows together. Screw Alex. He's too good. Too good for us. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, as a Jets fan, I'm so used to... I wasn't even too concerned. You know, it was almost natural for me to experience that. So I landed in Hawaii and found out that I'd lost. So I told my wife, you know, for five-year anniversary, I was like, all right, I need like half an hour. By the time we get out the airport, I'll be good to go. We'll start enjoying our vacation. But congrats to Alex. You know, great stuff on his on his side there. Oh, yeah. Alex is the best. And I basically conceded to both you guys. I've been nominated for that award 13 times and I've won once. So I got my win. I got my little, my little glass trophy that I've went on and broke by accident. Uh, but that's good enough for me. I just want some other people to win. Just to be nominated is so nice. But we're here to talk about golf betting, not fantasy golf yes. this time around. So can you explain to everyone what you did during the off season to look at profitability? Yeah. So this article was pretty much, I've always wondered, and you always give off these takes on, on your pods and stuff about, all right, take dead heats in this situation, take the better odds in this situation. But I've always kind of gone with the rule of thumb. Wasn't quite sure exactly how the math played out. So I went and grabbed every single top 20 bet that was be what you could place last year on BetMGM, which plays ties in full, DraftKings, which does not. They have dead heat rules, and FanDuel, which have which has way worse dead heat rules than DraftKings. So kind of went out there, dissected all that data, and kind of came up with a, a mathematical tipping point for when to bet dead heats when not to bet dead heats which one was the most profitable if you go with that overall and you know the the outcome was quite interesting it was very interesting to see what numbers came out so i guess the first thing that we should do because i get into this problem a lot like when i put up my cheat sheet every week and i'll be like oh i bet on this guy 125 to one with five places and inevitably i get like five emails 20 twitter replies like what what's in each way what's a placement so can you tell us what dead heat means in the context of a top 5 10 20 bet whatever it might be yes so dead heat is when there's more than five guys to finish top five, more than 20 guys to finish top 20. And what happens in that scenario, depending on which book you go to, if you got ties paid in full, a T18 that consists of five guys that goes to like 22, 23 places, that'll still get the full payout. DraftKings, they'll take your initial stake and then they take that amount and they divide your odds by the amount of dead heats applicable to the situation. And then FanDuel takes your entire stake and divides it by that amount. Like, I think one of my first interactions with you on Twitter was when I had a Bubba Watson top 10 at the Rocket Mortgage, I think, a few years ago. And there was like a crazy dead heat situation where multiple guys finished for a top 10 tie. And I lost like 
twenty dollars on my twenty five dollar bet, you know, like, and you still cashed. So they gave you the winning ticket, and it was you still gave them twenty dollars. So FanDuel is daylight robbery. I would stay clear of them regardless of how good their odds are. No matter what the odds are, it's just a dead heat rule is going to savage your your outcome there. So stick to DraftKings and BetMGM, and we'll get into the breakdown of why, yes, soon. Well, this happened at, this was surprising too, uh, at just the start of the new year, Bet365 kind of had the, exactly the same thing too. They even have like two separate markets now, one with dead heat, one without dead heat, yeah. uh, which is really interesting. I mean, just for peace of mind, it's really nice to bet the no dead heat, just so you're not like, well... I got a guy, he finished He finished inside the top 20, but he was T15. But there's 10 guys that also finished at T15. So now I only get half my stake on whatever the odds it was because the 10 guys, so 5 into 10, five, 10 guys mm-hmm. for 5 placements, then obviously it gets cut in half of whatever you bet. And if it was at like, you know, plus 125, you're not getting back what you put in to the bet to begin with. So that becomes problematic. But it should be noted that there are different odds for ones without each or one without dead heat and one with dead heat. Like the ones without dead heat have smaller odds than the ones with dead heat. Yes. And that's the interesting part because there's certain tiers that the odds are applicable to betting bets that have dead heat applied to them and guys that pay ties in full. So I'll I'll jump right into it, yeah, because if you if you are losing better in general, yes. If you're gonna bet just all the bets nonstop, you want to probably roll with BetMGM or Ties Paid in Full, which will I did all the math and for every single bet, your return on your investment for BetMGM Ties Paid in Full was fifteen. You'd lose fifteen point one percent at DraftKings. You'd lose sixteen point three percent on your investment. So if you're losing bets regularly, stick with the Ties Paid in Full. When you get the opportunity to cash, you want to make sure you cash. If you're a winning better, on the other hand, the every single bet for top 20 last year in 2023, the return on investment for ties paid in full was 137.5%. And the ties without dead heats or with dead heat, sorry, better odds was 1487 So there was a good like 11% difference in return there if you were a winning better. So for every single bet that won, that was the increase there and much more profitable in the long term. So you hit on something very interesting. Like as you know, and my audience knows, I'm a pretty, I love to bet on golf. Don't get me wrong. One of my favorite things to do, but I am pretty non, I'm serious about winning. Unfortunately, I never win, so I can't be that serious about it. I just, I, I mean, it's it's entertainment for me. If yes. it is entertainment betty, betting and you're not the type of person who wants to grind all these edges and use multiple books and look at multiple markets, do you think that, like, 11% difference either way, something like that, do you think that's still worth it to go through it or just be like, I just want to make this bet, it doesn't really matter. Now, I know the Rob Pozzolas of the world will tell you, like, this is where you don't pay the rake, basically. Like, if you yes. understand these concepts, over the long term, you save you save yourself eleven percent. If you make yeah. if you put in like twenty grand worth of bets over the course of a year, that turns into a pretty substantial amount of money. Yeah. Well, Pat, there's there's financial investment and there's emotional investment as well, right? So, I think that's where peace of mind is definitely worth the price. And I think ties paid in full for someone, the average guy who wants to just bet one book or so at a time, I think betting the ties paid in full is definitely the way to go because. There's no need to stress if the guy's going to finish inside the top 20 or not. And then also stress if he does finish inside the top <laughs> 20 and ties out, right? Like you don't need that double dipping of anxiety. So I think if you're just a, a casual guy looking to buy, buy in one book, get the ties paid in full, eat the juice a little bit, and just have that peace of mind of knowing that you're going to be just fine. So had, did you look at all into... Because you can parlay a lot of these together at certain books. You can basically make a same game parlay Mm. for a golf tournament and take, I want this guy top 40, this guy top 20. I think that would be really interesting without the dead heats because then you know exactly like there'd be nothing worse than playing a three leg i mean playing a three leg top 20 parlay probably isn't a great idea to begin with but it does sound like something that i would like to do and people who watch my show who wouldn't want to throw together a three banger parlay for a top 20 maybe sprinkle in a top 30 in there somewhere sounds like a fun way to waste money but if you like let's say you hit it but then there was a whole bunch of dead heats it would just be infuriating seeing what your payout would become yeah you, that's even the worst part because it's like plus 1200 turns into plus 250 and then you might as well just have better guy for top 40 to like a jabroni right so that's definitely not the way you want to rock and roll here and i'll give you some numbers on what to kind of go with in the top 20 market i pulled all the data for every single bet that there was and 
There were about 44 total top 20 bets last year that were shorter than minus 200. And only one of those bets had a dead heat reduction. The, the, the odds better than minus one, uh, minus 400 hit at a 75% clip between minus 300 and minus 400 hit at a 50% clip. And then between minus 200 and minus 300 hit at an 85% clip. So those, those bets hit at a pretty good rate and you can pretty much almost assure yourself is not going to be a dead heat because they typically the very best golfers. And when they're playing well, they're going to kind of avoid that range of dead heat reduction in the top tier of the top 20. They're going to be inside the top 10 usually. That, um, which that is a really interesting thing. that that reeks of Rory and Scotty finishing seventh in every tournament. Yes, <laughs> and a lot of those guys that put up all those total bets inside those short odds are definitely Rory, Scotty, Victor, Xander um, to be another one there, and it's pretty interesting. So I'll jump into this part of the article, which was really interesting to see. I was like, okay, so if I'm going to kind of figure out if I'm going to bet two different books. At what point does betting ties paid in full benefit me more than betting ties that have dead heat rules, but also better odds? And like I just mentioned, anything shy or shorter than like negative odds, minus 105 and south, that's where DK or ties that had uh, bets that had <laughs> no ties paid in full. This is a little complicated, but ties, ah, let me start again. Yeah, <laughs> the bets, I'm pulling a full on tambo. Um, the ties, here we go. All right. I'm pulling a, a tambo. Yeah. The bets that had dead heat reduction, they did much better in profitability when you paid negative odds, the ties paid in full. You definitely want to play them when there's plus money bets, because those are typically less likely to cash. And your guys are going to be fitting around the top 20 market. there, like in the T17 space because they just, not nearly as good as the guys that are priced at minus 205 or so. All so, right. wow. That, Got that out there finally, but it, well, listen, sense. It, it took a few ways to get it, but I think you described that pretty succinctly once we got to it, that if there's a minus in front of the number, taking the dead heat rule is fine because those guys generally are well yes. beyond in the top 20 market. They're usually inside the top 10. If they have negative odds, they don't actually fall into the dead heat trap a lot. But the worst players who are at plus money, you would want ties paid in full because they find themselves in these dead, hits, dead heat situations a lot. When you explain it like that, that actually makes a lot of intuitive sense. So much sense. And it's, it's like crazy to think that it took that much work to kind of figure that out. But yeah, we are. And it, it was just an epiphany. It was very nice to see. I just see this dark green box of of profitability for increased DK stuff. And then once it got into plus money, you can see the exact moment it happens. And it was just like a voila. And it was just beautiful. So um, yeah, plus money, ties paid in full, negative odds, take the dead heat chance. So that's what you looked at for top 20. Did you do a similar thing with top five, top 10, top 30, top 40? Or did you make top 20 the one that you looked at? That was my initial premise of the article. But I did go ahead and look into some dead heats for each ways and um, ties paid in full for for those bets that you're going to be grabbing each way markets on. So if you want to do the each ways for, it's kind of the opposite, which is quite interesting. Um, overall, if you want to take a bet and take the top five with ties paid in full, that is profitable across all, 100, all 222 winning bets last year for top fives. Um, there was about a 11% return on investment there for, for um, ties paid in full. But then when it comes to the the odds for top fives that were longer than plus 1,000, so 10 to 1 and longer, it seemed like it really liked the each ways where you could potentially find a much larger top five number and take the chance on that number cashing entirely without getting split. And there were a few instances where like um, some really short names like Zach Blair at 300 to 1 and David Lingmurth and Paul Haley at 200 to 1, those odds really juiced up that section of the the betting splits but i think if you're going to find a really juicy long odds number take the each way if you're going to see a significant decrease in price to take ties and paid in full i think the each way is the way to go at very very long odds the shorter they are you want to take the the ties paid in full so let, let's run an example on this. Like I bet Sahi, actually I bet Kurt Kitayama at Pebble Beach. He'll probably come in last place, but we're recording this before Pebble Beach. So to give people an impression here, I bet him at 150 to one with an each way of five places. So my five places pay one fourth the odds. What's one fourth of 150? 37 and a half, something like that? Yes. 
Boom. Yeah. Pat nailing it. So mm-hmm. to look at his top five or his top five odds without top finishes, including ties, top five for Kurt Kitayama, he's 20 to one. So I get an extra yeah. 17 and a half points of value, but I do leave myself open to splitting that number if there is a dead heat. So yeah. to me, that feels like enough in terms of return on my investment that I would want to do it. But I think you're right. Like I see a lot of people play and it might be a good way to keep your ecosystem going in terms of your bankroll. Like if I take like at the same tournament, if I took Scotty Scheffler eight to one with eight places at 150 odds. Now, like you said, uh, maybe that ends up being a pretty good bet because there's no real top eight market, but you're basically yeah. killing all of your odds to begin with. And like, if he does feel like you have to bet so much, so now you have to cover yourself on the outright and the each way that if he loses, you lose yeah. a ton of money. But where you say he finishes upwards of even the top 10, top five, whatever it is so often that maybe that ends up allowing you to tread water and not basically your ROI for the week isn't a minus a hundred. Like it tends to be a lot of, or your ROI is zero. Like it is for me, a lot of the the time like yeah. hey there's a lot of weeks where every cent i put in i don't get back on golf mainly because i'm playing outrights and not playing a lot of these markets but if i were to do that with sh- with each ways on shorter odds base players you know then i would return like you know instead of if i let's just use a theoretical example of i put in a thousand dollars every week to bet on golf i'm not putting in a thousand dollars to bet on golf every single week but let's say that i am that through all of the bets that i have if i get wiped out i lose the thousand dollars that if i played in each way on a scheffler or a max homa or something like that with one eighth the placements that instead of losing all a thousand i might lose like 600 instead of a thousand yes and i think that's a great way to look at it because you kind of playing that conservative route. And what I learned about this is I've typically, I bet a lot of top 20s, a lot of top 40s. And I start my, my betting threshold has always been plus money until I did this article and realized how profitable the guys that are in the negative odds can be. So I totally have changed up my entire situation where taking on those negative odds, I think the golf betting community typically prides themselves on the fact that we bet these plus money odds only to, to a large degree outside of matchups. And it doesn't make sense to me. I think there's a lot of value to be gained on these shorter odds on guys that are typically like Xander right now. Just betting him top 20 nonstop has been really, really profitable despite him constantly not finishing inside the top fives or or so like to contend for a win, right? So he's the kind of guy you really want to lean into that avenue of of betting. For yeah, sure. So basically, and, yeah. so so basically what you're saying is that if I take my thousand dollars instead of distributing it over seven guys from 20 to one to 150 to one and a a top 40 on some absolute goober at like 16 to one from the back end of the field that I'd just be better off taking my thousand dollars and betting Xander Shoffley at minus 175 to top 20 every week. Boom. Exactly. They, they way more likely to happen. The, the chances of dead heats are are less. And from an, from an each way perspective real quick, I wanted to just mention this. There were 23 times that there was an each way split for top fives last year in 38 events and 17 times it was only with one guy so going back to that Kurt Kitayama situation you're basically going to get the 20 to 1 if you're splitting the 20 the 37 and a half in half right so it's going to be what 18 or so to one once the the one guy dead heats that um there were six other instances where it was two and three so combined um there's only one time there was only three guys for a tie for five so it was rather interesting to see and I think you know taking those long odds for the long guys is the way to go um and then to get to your point about the the top 20 situation, I was taking a peek at at some numbers for the guys that have been the most profitable across all the different markets <laughs> going into the into the year um, for 2023. And when you take a look at, I wanted to bet to win $100 in every single tournament, you know, for every different bet. If you did that for every single bet, not a single guy shows up to win the most money for an outright. You're going to be investing the least, so your return on investment is going to be the most. But just to win $100 repeatedly, there were multiple instances where there was a top 20. I think looking at my numbers, yeah, we we had 20 of the top 20 guys there. 12 of them were top 20 bets. Seven were top 10s, and then three were top fives. So like, you really want to take those conservative odds, and really, if you wanted to build a bankroll, kind of lean into that market the most and kind of just pursue guys that you know are going to be finishing inside the top 20 quite often. 
Well, the, the, the next assignment that I need to put you on when you go and run these numbers are that if we've identified that the top end players and their top 20 odds may actually be profitable for us to bet on, despite the fact that no one wanting to bet on them, because I mean, listen, we're all doing content for one thing. So it's a lot more fun yeah. to say, I bet Sahith the Gallet 75 to one, not I bet Xander at minus 175 to come inside the top 20. Although the minus 175 guy is the guy who actually wins money. And I'm sitting here losing every bet that I put in every week. That's just not a lot of fun for the content. And if people are entertainment gamblers, which which I would probably say 98%, no matter how sharp most people think they are, they're entertainment, they're fish gamblers. I'm a fish gambler and I do it basically every single day. I'm still a fish when it comes to this. I have no real process. I like to bet on, you know, I do my research. I try to come up with good angles on things. I think that I know something and then my results show me I actually don't know anything. So it's really a roundabout way of saying that people yeah. want to hit a 71 win. They want to be able to invest $10 in a tournament and return 1000 or $25 to return 2000 yes. or something like that. Like, that's fun. That gives you the entertainment aspect of what you're looking for because you have to invest more money if you're betting something at minus 200 or minus 150. And if it doesn't go, like, it, it, would, feel, it would feel really shitty, especially the first time that you did it, being like, all right, I'm shifting up my strategy. No more outright betting. No more top <laughs> five betting. I'm taking all the money that I normally bet, and I'm putting it on Xander to come inside the top 20 at minus 175. What would that pay you at if I put 1000 on that? like 600 bucks you get 1600 back ish yeah so yeah yeah that'd be great i bet a thousand to win 600 who wouldn't want to win 600 bucks during a golf tournament you do that you know every second week and you're going to be dancing for the entire season but if you just lose it you'd probably never do it again correct that's where bankroll management you know all that kind of stuff unit allotment we can get into all of that if we needed to but i think the the tough part is is, is kind of accepting the long run probability of all of the stuff and it's it's really you just got to understand that there's going to be variability and times can be really tough out there especially to start the 2024 year and you know um but so far the top 20 guys have been pretty solid outside of the toy pine so we'll see what cooks going forward but um like you mentioned i do that breaking 100 article which got us nominated last year and can you, i only can, have can 100 dollars to can, bet can you explain yeah, explain that article because i think it's a really cool concept yeah. especially if people have a hundred dollars they're like hey i'm willing to lose a hundred dollars on every golf tournament that's the price that it would take me to bring my kid to a movie for two hours i can spend this hundred dollars on four days of golf i think it's a really sharp way of doing it because most people aren't betting a thousand dollars they're betting 20 bucks here 50 bucks here whatever yeah. it is but you, the conceit of your article is that you have a hundred dollars to bet each week on golf here's how you do it Exactly. And I typically split it up to $20 for outrights, about $60 or $50 for matchups, $15 bucks for, or 30 bucks depending on if I find good matchups there. And then $5 for the farewell fiver, which is a complete degenerate, <laughs> like three ball round one parlay that I have some fun just trying to sweat on round one. But for the most part, it's really trying to focus on how to spend your money across the betting market. Because what I try to do is cover my outright cost by hitting all my placement bets using the majority of my funds in that market and then taking the $20 and using that for outrights, which I've now even decreased even less by including top fives. Because I went back and realized I'm hitting a top five every other tournament in 2023 and I hit like four outrights all year. <laughs> so it was just so frustrating to not capitalize on a Jordan Spieth water ball at the Valspar and not getting anything in return. So betting top fives, I've kind of gone to that market to cover my outright costs entirely. So now I'm no longer just losing a little bit less because of my top five. I'm actually making money by top fiving. And then the rest of my card can take care of business in that department. So when I hit an outright, it's not nearly going to be as much, but it's still going to be a solid return. And and every more, more so often the weeks where I kind of return some money, like you mentioned earlier. And it's funny because when it comes to golf betting, I've done this strategy, what you're talking about, prorated up or down, depending on what it is, and almost everything else that I've done in terms of the betting world. Like, I just where hitting a big winner in golf is so much fun. That's really the thrill for me in doing it that I don't really feel like it's, you know, it's spent money the moment the bet is made, that it's not too concerning for me if I end up losing it. Um, I never have gotten over my skis in terms of betting too much money, that it's, you know, 
like I said, an entertainment cost. But like when it came to reevaluating how I played DraftKings golf, I went down back down to the like I wanted to be like, hey, should I play 150 lineups? Should I play 50 lineups? Should I play 75 mm-hmm. lineups? I went back and just played the 50 cent contest and worked on what if I try this? What if I try this? So my investment was $75 every week in golf yeah. instead of having to you know max it out at like 70 or 750 or a thousand dollars like take my lumps until i develop a better strategy and then i can build it back out from there nfl betting this year i did really well with nfl betting mainly because i focused on props and yeah i'd have fun playing almost like you said like the the five dollar the you know the fifty dollar degenerate everything together prop same game parlay but i just bet big on three or four props every single week that the numbers told me were going to be profitable over time. Some weeks you go one and three, some weeks you go four and oh, most weeks you go three and one and boom. Yeah, you're just having a very highly profitable year. It's just funny that because there are no big bets in some of those other sports that I never feel the need to change it up and try to take some sort of long shot. There is something about the allure of golf that just draws yes. everyone to the outright though, right? Yeah, I mean like Detroit or let's say who who just made a crazy run to kind of get into the playoffs like someone bucks. like to get six yeah the bucks at like what 60 to one to win the super bowl like we we're doing that stuff every week on well last year at least you know <laughs> not this year but um 60 to one in the golf market's nothing you know that's just like chump change to us and we we hit the 150 to ones and things but a 60 to one in nfl is just mind-blowing to people it's kind of in, insane to think about so if you put that into perspective like why are we going after these crazy situations but at the same time like you said Nobody's going to do a podcast, and that's what I'm really struggling with. Is I'm so good at betting the placements and matchups that I'm trying to hype that up, but no one cares. You know, everyone wants the winner, and that's that's all that it is at the end of the day. So it's it's tough, but off you go. You know, you kind of make your make your bed where you can. Well, uh, I I may. I mean, by the time this comes out, one of the episodes will have already aired. I'm trying out some new things during the golf season that I'm taking the best bet show that I did with Cam and Rob that people seem to enjoy so much during NFL season. I'm parsing it over to PGA season for Wednesdays that will have PGA best bets that aren't outright winners or anything. It will mainly focus on head-to-head matchups, placements, and things like that. And you, sir, are invited to come on and be one of the panelists on that. We're going to switch up with different people every single week. Like the first one we did had uh degenerate 75 and cam on you got to have cam on the first one yes and we'll just have like a rotating cast of people to come on and mix it up and talk about bets that way because you know i i listen i it was fun the first few years i mean it's always fun when we're talking about outright winners but the first few years that jeff and i did this like we hit like 11 outright winners it was great every year yeah (laughs) yeah and the the thing is the golf books have got so much sharper so we like just struggling to find good value and you know, if you're trying to get your seven extra turn, you got so many less guys on your card. So you got to find ways to make your bucks somewhere else. And you guys have figured that out. So it's it's all good. And yeah, that'll be so fun to come on the show for that, Pat. And one of the favorite things about matchups, I just want to put that out there real quick, is it's the only book or the only bet that the book doesn't have like an ultimate edge on you. Like a top 20, a top 10, uh, an outright, whatever. If your guy WDs, the book gets that money. But in a matchup, if your opponent WDs, you get that money, which I just love. And, you know, it's like you versus the other guy, and that's the way to go. And it's, to me, one of my favorite bets ever. So you always put out the post-round data. Like, you, I mean, you're the model maniac, at the model maniac on X or Twitter, whatever it is that you use. And again, code maniac Mm -hmm. at Rotoballer for all Byron stuff. But you always put that out for assessing three balls or head-to-head matchups after the round. I mean, this is all the all information in the live stats feed that you can find at fantasynational.com, uh, fantasynational.com slash mayo to get yourself 20% off. That's like one of the big keys of it is that, hey, you can just grab this data right away and you can make your own adjustments to it. So obviously you're running that data through something uh, that you have as your model. But if people just want to, like I said, play a hundred bucks and you have like, you know, you have 25 bucks to bet, would you ever recommend betting a full would you, if you had the hundred bucks, let's say twenty dollar a bet on each of these matchup bets, would you bet them pre-tournament? Would you bet them round one three ball, or would you wait for round one to happen and utilize that data and then start picking off three balls? That's a really good question because I think what you got to do is take that twenty bucks and turn it into five dollars and bet all of them. 
and see where you have the most success because it's different for everybody. I'm not the best at finding value in just a round by round situation. I'm much better at a tournament long. I like the long run probability of my guys sticking to their stats over four rounds. There's also a cut involved. So you can find guys that don't make cuts as often. So you can just cash that bet. If your guy might not be the necessarily like the high end player, but he makes a lot more cuts than someone that doesn't, you can cash that bet on a Friday. Whereas round one stuff, you know, it's the volatility in that round by round stuff just doesn't quite sit with me that well. So I've never really had that good of an outcome in the round by round stuff. So just it's each to their own. You got to figure out what you're the best at and go from there. But matchups in general are the way to go. All right. I like that. Anything else? I mean, we you wanted to ask me about profitable golfers. Do you want to give me the quiz now? Uh, sure. Um, I had a few names here that were... You kind of take a look at these names and you think, you know, if I just bet this guy nonstop for a top 10, he's going to be cashing me for for the whole year, right? So the guy that lost the most amount of money, if you bet him for top 10 last year, Pat, who would that be in your opinion? Trying to win $100 every time you make a bet. Yeah, so, so the guys with the steeper odds would obviously be a bigger loss if you didn't get it correct. Yes. I mean... I bet Colin Morikawa basically every week and he didn't do shit. So is it him or Justin Thomas? Justin Thomas is definitely on the list. He was one of, he's the all time loser across the board. Outrides, top fives, top tens, top twenties. He, really? what? he okay. lost a one, What? Really? Yeah. $1,199 Justin Thomas lost if you try to bet him top 10, top 20 last year. So that was a bad market to chase him on. But the guy I'm talking about for top tens is Adeki Matsuyami. Lost... $587 if you try to win $100 per bet, betting a decky for top 10. And that's the most out of anyone that I can see. So crazy situation. And guess what? He had like four three putts in five holes to finish T13 this week again. So stay clear of a decky top 10s until further notice. Interesting. That That's that my mind just, and he had a really bad year, obviously. I mean, you just take yeah. a look at his outright odds to win tournaments now. They're like 60 to one and just, it, it doesn't quite process the same way, but I mean, mm -hmm. that's probably, probably the best way if you were to make like a logical assumption on who the most profitable versus non-profitable in a lot of these markets would be, would be, Hey, what were their odds at this tournament last year? Are they higher or lower than what they are right now? Yes. And are they playing better or worse than they are right now? based off of how they played at the tournament last year. Kind of crazy stuff. So that's something I've definitely looked at and incorporating to my betting since this article. It's just, is a guy worth, is it worth betting a guy? Like for Terrell Hatton, for instance, you want to bet him to finish in RIP. Jeez, uh, <laughs> what a terrible name to bring up. But um, <laughs> when he was on the PGA Tour, he he was a top 10 beast. You know, like you'd be making a lot more money if you spend your money on top 10s versus top 20s for Terrell. So, um, and then obviously the first time I do that at, at uh, the Kapalua tournament for the century, he goes and finishes T12 or something. So tough scenes um, out at the Sony there, but he's going to have fun on Live With John now. So good good for Terrell. No, yeah, he's getting that automatic paycheck. How couldn't you have some fun over on the Live tour? I, I, have you dug into Live markets at all? No. Yeah. I, I mean, there's no data, Pat. Like how, how are we supposed to, unless you're watching it, on what? You know, I don't have a CW subscription. I don't have whatever I need, but... I think it's more of an eye test situation. And these guys have got top end talents that are, are getting beat by Jeff Ogilvy's and people like that. You know, like he's not even on the tour, but you know, like what are we doing with, with Martin Keimer beating Brooks Kupka in any sort of event? You know, that just never happens on the PGA tour. So I'm, I've got no interest in that situation. And um, we'll stick to where guys really care about how they play week in, week out for the most part here on the PGA. Would they be? Have you? No. I mean, I, I, I yeah. told I told Feinberg on one of the recent shows that we did. Just I might just bet like Bryson every week and have fun with it that way because I want to root for Bryson. Yeah, I think that's the way to go. You find your favorite guy and just see where, just go with the vibes. You know, like if he's got a nice, nice area going back home, they should play better there. Um, bet Cam Smith in Australia every time. So I don't know. I bet Cam Smith in Australia every single time, unless he's not playing against live guys, and he comes in dead last. <laughs> He's also fallen off, and he looks a little chunky too. I'm, my, my, my man crush is not doing the best things for me out there on the live tour. He needs to come back to the PGA so uh, Mrs. Mania can have a bit more problems on, on my side there. So, um, yeah, we'll see. I don't know. He's wearing the shades now as well. And who, who puts their shades in their back pocket? Like, you got to put them on the hat, the back of the hat, or wear them. The back pocket shades is just not a way to go. I'm, I'm not a fan of that at all. Are, are so you used to figure that out. 
maybe they have so much money that they don't care about the market, but just the the lack of live traction that has happened so far. And maybe I mean, I've, unless live blew up over the you know, week that in between us filming this and me airing this, uh, maybe I'll look like a complete moron when I'm talking about this. But the fact that they haven't catered to us, the people who are the most engaged, be it through daily fantasy or betting, with something as simple as like a template, a boilerplate template for stats that we can track every round. But it's like they have geared this entire tour for 80-year-olds to watch, which is not a crazy thing because it's a golf audience, yet they only exist in places where 80-year-olds would never find them. Yep. They've they've cornered the market that they've had, and it's it's the tiniest corner on the planet. We not even it hasn't been even found yet. But um just thinking about all the guys that they have, it's like Phil Mickelson and Martin Kaime, Louis Stays, and all those guys. Those like, oh, you know, top 10 in green irregulation rates. Let's bet the guy. I feel like that's the way they want to rock and roll. We can't even bet that stuff here in Iowa. So I don't even, they don't like us to bet stuff in Iowa yeah, for, for the, the Saudi stuff. So it just doesn't make sense whatsoever. And throwing that amount of money around, surely just a few million dollars is lying around to get some, pay some people to be on a golf course and shooting some lasers. Like, how is that not even a thing yet? It doesn't make any sense to me. Well, the other thing as well that I talked about with both Tim and Jeff is that, like, I don't even know when these tournaments are happening. Like, that's a problem. If I don't know when they're happening, there's a good chance 99.9% .9 of people <laughs> don't know when they're happening. Like, I went to go check the yeah. odds to bet on it today, uh, and it's a Monday of a tournament. So, like, the, the Bahrain Open has odds posted already. Pebble Beach has yeah. odds posted already. The Senior Tour, the LPGA Tour, the Corn Ferry Tour, Panama Championship. That has live odds going on. No live odds to be found. Yeah. They don't... It's... It makes no sense. The The product itself is unsustainable. And that's what just is the mind-blowing thing about this, is there's nothing about it sustainable. The moment they just pull the plug on the funding, it's done. It's, it's not self-sustaining. There's no returning revenue generating from these people and they just keep adding to the expense roll. And that's the craziest part too. So we'll have to see what happens, but sheesh, I hope we get a, a merger here soon because it's really starting to feel rough betting on these guys that are, um, I mean, we had nobody show up this week uh, at the Tory. So that'll be two weeks from now, but um, yeah, tough scenes. We need to, we need to get like a nice, collaborative golf situation again because i i miss all the best players in the world playing together see i don't i don't like i've really enjoyed golf through the first few weeks of january just because i found that every finish has been super exciting like that's all i mean it sucks that i'm not winning bets and no one is winning bets i would prefer to have like oh, yeah we were all on matthew pavon to win that would have been great at big odds yeah. uh but obviously we weren't there was like three people in the world who were on matthew pavon and i was not one of them so but to watch it like, just because I was losing bets doesn't mean that I wasn't any less engaged. Like, I wanted to see who was going to win. It was actually exciting TV for me to watch. And, like, that is a that that is a compelling product to me no matter what. And yeah. I, I don't know if that's sustainable, if none of the big names ever get into it. But building new stars, creating a lot of variability at the top of mm -hmm. tournaments, I do think is exciting TV. Absolutely. And the fact like no one has seen Jake Knapp swing a golf club and then you see him swing it like molasses and it's going 190 miles per hour ball speed. It's crazy to see these guys coming on to tour from the Corn Ferry and, and the DP where that leaderboard was just completely like a complete Ryder Cup battle royale. You know, we had all those DP World Tour guys at the top, foreigners and, and Jets fans alike. And then we had a bunch of Americans that um, were kind of chasing them down. So it it does add that international feel now that we've lost the top you know top talents elsewhere, but it it really does let the the riffraff at times just rise to the top and and make it for like Nick Dunlap, holy cow! Like talk about an ascension to stardom out of nowhere, and he's been playing well in college, but we wouldn't have expected that on the PGA Tour. But yet, yeah, we are. He's playing in a designated event here with Rory McIlroy and Scotty Scheffler in his sophomore year of college, which he's no longer even doing. So fun times. Yeah, I can't wait for my my, my guy Adrien Dumont de Charest from Belgium to end up breaking onto the scene in a big way on the PGA Tour. Who's your guy from South Africa, that huge dude who bombs it? Alistair Poltergeist. Aldrich Potgieter. Yeah, 19 years old. He used to play he used to play rugby as a prop and decided that wasn't for him and decided to play golf and now he's winning winning tournaments everywhere. And um unbelievable. You know, we've got we need some 
right young talents from South Africa because Bezzy just ain't moving the needle for me. You know, the the plodding along isn't what I'm looking for. I need some bombers, and we've got some serious, serious thoroughbreds coming through the ranks here. So Ald Aldrick should take care of business for us here when he gets into his 20s and out of the Corn Ferry. So I think he just won, right? Yeah. So, like, well, yeah. I, I, th this was something that I briefly talked about that, I mean, I love the DP World Tour because I think it's very scenic. Uh, I love the courses and there's just certain guys mm -hmm. that I like to get behind. And it's fun to follow their careers of like, hey, they're this. I mean, Mathieu Pavon was a really good one. Moronk, who just went to live, is a really good one. Like guys that you know, I've gotten behind over the years, betting over there, or, well, watching them at whatever random event that happens. I mean, help, having kids helped that I was up at 6 a.m. on a Sunday morning be like, well, Euro golf song. Let's, Jesus, this course in Switzerland looks really nice. Let's watch this for three hours. And then you get to know a lot of these guys, and it's fun to watch them you know, play their way onto the PGA Tour and get into majors, and you can root for them that way. But in terms of actual skill level at this point, the DP World Tour has been pretty diluted, both from Liv and a lot of the guys just making the jump to the PGA Tour. Would you say that the Corn Ferry Tour has more talent than the DP World Tour now? Ooh, that's a great question. And I think, I think it, it's, I'll give you a Ryder Cup answer. I think if the Corn Ferry Tour players went to Europe, they would get waxed. But if the Europeans came and played on the Corn Ferry Tour, the Yanks would take care of them over here. Because I think you require a different skill set in America versus on the DP World Tour. Those scenic courses have trees and mountains in the way. Whereas you take a look at the driving distance on the Corn Ferry Tour, the guys are like, just bombing it out there 330 yards up up, you know, so it's not really that challenging over here, I don't think. Um, so it's different skill sets, and I'm going to kind of crop out on that answer, I think, depending where they play. But in general, I would think American talent just is always going to be better than the rest of the world. Well, it's very interesting, like from your perspective, because you came over to America to play golf. Like, what is it like in South Africa? Like, if you are up and coming versus the facilities and opportunity that you would have in the States, like why, why come to America and not stay? Well, most of the people in South Africa are leaving because it's not, you can get robbed on a golf course in South Africa. In America, that's not necessarily going to happen. The facilities are amazing. We've got great weather all the time. The coaching, you know, the coaching down there is fantastic. We've got so much like history and, and talent in the golfing industry. And it, the weather's perfect. You can golf in South Africa pretty much all year round. There's like five days a year that it's cold. And the thing is, it's just the, the lucrativeness of dollars. The the country itself is in shambles. You never know if you're going to go grab a sandwich at halfway and your clubs are, are stolen, you know, like if you leave them outside. So it's a it's a bit of a situation. And I think that's the main allure to get over here. And obviously the Sunshine Tour, not nearly as um, profitable as, as playing on the PGA Tour. But I think the talent is pretty solid across the board. It's just tricky for them to get across here because they got to qualify through Corn Ferry and, and things like that. But the good, the good guys are good enough to get through that. So looking forward to our young crop of guys coming through. Well, it's going to be exciting. I, I think that this is where the DP World Tour can really step in, just offer more memberships to players from like countries from yeah. all over the world that if it is that hard to get to the States, then, hey, and then you know, come play on the DP World Tour or play on the Challenger Tour. We'll make it easy for you. And if you do win, we'll promote you right away. Like that would be a very interesting way to get up through it. I did see the Safari Tour where we used to bet the Kabogi Man at like 2000 or 2,500 to one. Uh, it seems like they stole all the money of the players and they didn't pay anyone. Yeah, that's that's also, you know, the Safari Tour, they took it and, and ran, but um, there's always odds. There's always odds out there for anybody that wants to get, get going, but um, RIP to that tour as well. It's kind of crazy how the world works, huh? It's it's kind of nuts, and especially the golf yeah. world too, because uh, you get to try to like buy prestige and put on like classy events, and it's all just a bait and switch job where they're just pocketing the money and taking off. Yeah, no, no good. Uh, the Great Abaco Classic out in Bahamas won't ever do that. So stick to the Corn Ferry Tour. I think we're we're in good shape over there. I, I, it's funny that like you, the money hasn't trickled down to, and I mean they probably need to save every cent that they have on the PGA tour to try to compete with live yeah. to pay these purses that they can't afford anyway, that obviously there's not going to be a trickle down effect to the corn Ferry tour in terms of purses, but it must be, you must lose so much money if you're not good playing on the corn Ferry tour. Cause I've met a few guys that play on the Canadian tour and like outside of two guys, basically every single year, everyone else just loses a ton of money. Yeah. I think a great follow is a case of golf or a case of the golf, a Monday Q guy. 
he he does such a great job of putting out these financial situations that these guys are in. Their golf clubs get stolen at random golf courses. They they're winning seventeen hundred dollars, but their expenses for the week were thirty five hundred, and and now their golf clubs are stolen. So there's like GoFundmes for like every tenth play on the Corn Ferry Tour, and it's fascinating that that's the grassroots of the PGA Tour, and yet we still go funding people from private entities to try and get these guys on the tour. I'd imagine that at some point we can, you know, disperse a bit of the funding to them and really help those boys get onto the PGA uh, without financial bankruptcy looming. You know, I mean, to have played golf under any circumstance is difficult. Never mind having to like think about waiting tables after you're around and at the Abaco, you know, so um, they need to get that figured out for sure. Yeah. How, I mean, when you were playing, like how much training did you, cause you, you look like a big guy that were, how far, how far were you able to put it out? Well, right now I've hit it further than I've ever hit it. <laughs> and I'm about 70 pounds heavier than I was when I came to America. So God bless the large Cokes and, <laughs> and Baconators, um, and long winters, which is also a problem, but, um, I was golfing often, you know, like after every Every day at school, if I wasn't playing tennis or, or cricket or something, I'd be out at the golf course. And and then your parents would just drop you off on a Saturday. You play 36 holes, go play 36 holes on a Sunday, do all that stuff and just kind of grinding, grinding, grinding away. And and I've just, I've always been a good driver of the ball. I've never been a good iron player. And that's the problem is I could scramble my face off and make tons of pars, but could never go low. I've never really shot super, super low scores. And I wish I knew the stats I knew now because I would just be hitting irons all goddamn day because <laughs> that's where it's made and everyone tells you growing up no nope, make sure your short game sharp because you never want to make bogeys but at the end of the day you want to have a four footer for birdie every now and then to make life easy on you which i just was not doing so um hitting it millions miles now but uh yeah still hitting the irons all over the place it's funny because you you do hear that i mean a lot of that just came with the class anything that rhymes people kind of like you know drive for show putt for dough and it turns out that was like the exact opposite of how money was actually distributed <laughs> yes. on tour for 25 years that the best drivers were the ones who were getting paid all of the money and like the shittiest putters still won all the money because they were so good at everything else to you. I mean, like Scotty Scheffler still makes like 40 million bucks a year in winnings. Guy can't putt to save his life. But I do think when you're someone like me who like vacillates between say like an eight or a 14 handicap, like depending on how much yeah. that I play, that having a really good short game for me saves me a ton of strokes, mainly because my short game can cost me an awful lot of strokes. But when you get yes. to the level that you are at where you do need to go low, it's it's almost like we, we talk about with some of these tournaments where, yeah, it's great that your guy's great at chipping. That's fantastic. I would prefer he just be putting for birdie. That's how you're going to win. <laughs> yeah. I was watching the PGA Tour Live and they were going about, you know, if I could pick one stat, it would be Brian Harmon being the number one scrambler on the PGA Tour. <laughs> and I just wanted to rip my hair out. I was like, you guys have no idea. What are you doing in the booth? You don't even know how stats are relevant to like tour earnings. Being the number one scrambler means you're missing so many freaking greens. Get it together, hit the birdie putts from five feet and let's rock and roll. Like, I don't understand at all. But yes, I guess there is relevance to being the worse you are, the more important missing a, a four-footer can be. Um, whereas, you know, on a on a better scratch level, I guess four-footers, unless you Luke List and, and company, um, Ludwig on a on a POA surface or a decky on POA, um, you kind of make those on regularity. Well, it's a compounding thing when you're not that good. Like if you have, like if you're like on the apron or something, and then you pull out a you know a 58 and you try to get it close, <laughs> like you're not playing a ton of spin, like you're just not great at those shots. And when you're not good, like holding a 60 degree wedge in your hand for a chip can be like super uncomfortable. So then, even though you're let's say 20 yards away from the hole with this chip with all the green to work with, you just fuck it up so badly. You're now 20 feet away in a spot that you don't want to be because the chip was so bad, and you're like live the three putt from there too so if you could just chip it to four feet and make the putt you know you'd save yourself at least two strokes twice around if you were a bad golfer where that just isn't even in play if you're good all right so i'll give you some let's do a little bit of coaching here towards the end of the show how i chip is i take a seven iron and if you're two yards away from the green you want to hit your, your seven iron two yards and then it would roll out additional seven of that seven times so it'll roll out 14 if you take the eight iron, you want to hit it two yards, it will roll out 12. And ultimately, you want your lob wedge to go half the distance. You want your sand wedge to go two thirds of the distance after it bounces. So a pitching wedge is a quarter, a nine iron is one fifth, and go that way. You want to just go to the putting green, 
and hit every club that you have from lob wedge to seven iron two yards onto the green and see how far it rolls out. So that way, when you are just off the green and need a chip, instead of wandering out hard to hit a 58, all you have to do is find the right club and hit it two yards just on the green and it should roll out to a general area around the hole. You just shaved like seven strokes off my game. Boom. Done. But I'm still going to try to hit a flop shot with my sister. <laughs> Way more fun to try to put some zip on it. Yes. Well, uh, that's also a thing. Like when you are when you know that you're not great, it's almost like betting outright winners in golf. It's like it's fun to try to hit this flop shot from the terrible location that like I top the ball and it goes an inch in front of me. I still, the one time that it works, it's like aiming between the trees from the <laughs> trees instead of just easily playing it back out to the fairway. The one time it works makes up for the 50 times that the ball might hit a tree and ricochet by your head. Absolutely. I I have my enjoyment factor in golf has just been exponential since getting out of college because I'll take those shots on now. You know, you take a take a few swigs of Keystone and off you go and and every now and then they pay off and you look like a complete OG in front of your buddies and they go and, you know, tell everyone about it and it's just life is good. You can tell the misses and think about it forever, but no one cares about hitting a stock seven iron to pin high 12 feet on a, on a tough par, par four, you know, like we want to, the hero shots are where it's at. And I totally agree. Byron Lindeku at the model maniac on Twitter, rotoballer.com code maniac to get all of your work. What can people expect from you every single week? Every single week. So I've actually started doing a late night Sunday research. So, so I just got done with that at one o'clock this morning, three and a half hours. I deep dive pretty much all the top guys in the model, all the guys I think are going to win this week. And I timestamp it. So you can like kind of go and find each take I have for each different golfer. Then on Mondays, I do a stat buffet that kind of takes every top 20 of my model, pops it out there. It shows you which guys are ranked inside which thing for all these million different stats. Um, on Tuesdays, I do the breaking 100 article and my show, um, on back nine bets. And then me and Spencer will be doing a Rotoballer PGA show every night uh, at 9.30 for Rotoballer on Mondays. And then Wednesdays, we do a little bit of value plays here and there. So there's an article every day. There's usually a podcast every day or so before the tournament. And then there's tons and tons of showdown stuff as the week unfolds. That's kind of my thing. I love I love showdown versus week-long stuff. And I feel like I've got a really good model for that that you can get over there at rotoballer.com and use it to your advantage. Well, at the time that we record this, Pat Mayo won a Showdown GPP this week for round one uh, using the tools at FantasyNational.com. So FantasyNational.com slash Mayo. Uh, make it easy on yourself and generate those lineups. Although I am out of the Showdown game now because I only play Showdown three times a year. The Amex, Torrey Pines, and Pebble Beach, and that's it. I think those are the only wow. times because those I those are the only times that I feel like I have an advantage in DraftKings Showdown because okay. I'm not running the same numbers okay. that you're doing a lot of the time. Sure. That I it just it's not even that I have an advantage is that people play it so stupidly at those weeks. Like why you would ever consider in the first two rounds at Torrey Pines, why you would ever consider playing anyone at the South Course is beyond me. Yep, here I was with 25 percent Colin Morikawa because he's got one of the best course histories on the South and. Goes and misses the cut, hitting it in the pesky. So and you I'm with like, you. I'm and, one of those guys. And, but. You, and you can be like me and just be like, no, I'm going to play. Johnny Vegas shot plus six at the south course. I am playing him at the north course. What does he do? Seven under. Like, it's just an easy. Yep. You, 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 in order to win, you have to maximize your lineups. So if you just give someone the yeah. super easy course, it's it's it was like at the Amex. Just like as much as, and Tambo talked me out of like trying to get tricky and playing good guys at the stadium course. And it would have worked if you had just landed on Justin Thomas and no one else in the third round, if you were playing it that way, or you could just play dudes at La Quinta who all shot like 64. Exactly. The needle in the haystack on the tough courses is it's a, it's a journey I'm not willing to go on anymore. It's enough. We've had enough of those quests. So I'm with you. Stick to the simple stuff. Don't be don't be overthinking things. Yeah, and it's funny that uh, like kind of breaking it back down to certain things. Like I try to overcomplicate golf betting for myself so much that I think it's actively made me worse at golf betting. Where back in the day, I used to be like, "All right, here's what my feel is. I'll go research some stuff, and boom, I'm on my way. Here's my my four convictions of the week. They might win, they might lose, but I used to hit at a higher clip back then. And I try to think of like what I do for something as rudimentary as showdown, and be like, "Oh yeah, just don't play people at that course. Play people at that course." That that works and it does work like just the, the simplest yeah. stuff sometimes is the best way to do it and i think that harkens back to your point about betting good players at top 20 like the they're actually undervalued despite the fact that you look at it and no one wants to bet these odds exactly and what i've also been doing is for week-long stuff if i find the chalkiest guy 
I had a bookie reach out to me, gave me his free credit. So I've just been betting the chalkiest dude for top 20 and just hammering him every week. And it's been paying off just fine. So it's like, don't overthink it. Let the market adjust the odds for you and, and just go with the chalkiest guy in DFS. So you've won a ton of money on Eric Cole over the past six months. <laughs> Eric Cole, Xander Shafley, you know, all those guys, just the chalk donkeys coming through, baby. So it's been fun. All right. Well, thank you all for watching. Hope you learned a little bit about golf betting and how golf works in South Africa. Smash a like to the channel, sub to Mayo Media Network, and turn on those auto downloads for Spotify Podcasts and Apple Podcasts. Leave us a five-star rating while you're over there as well. I'm Pat Mayo. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Pat Mayo Experience! Experience!